Now to part two of our week-long series, Drug. Tonight we take a look at America's tens of thousands of pharmacies, many of which appear to play a key role in the opioid crisis. Clay County, Kentucky is one of the poorest places in America. The unemployment rate there is nearly 10%. That's more than twice the national rate. Despite the poverty, local pharmacies are thriving. Consider the town of Manchester, Kentucky, where the population of 1,500 can choose between 11 different pharmacies, many of which seem to make their money primarily by selling prescription painkillers. Opioid addiction rates are heavily correlated with availability. In many countries, opioids can only be administered at hospitals or specially licensed pharmacies. In America, by contrast, anyone with a prescription can pick up addictive opioid painkillers at the local drugstore. In poor places like Clay County, it's even easier because Medicaid covers the bill. Easy access to highly addictive drugs at no cost leads to the exact outcome you would expect. Medicaid beneficiaries are twice as likely to have opioid prescriptions as the general population and they are three to six times more likely to overdose on them. In Clay County, the consequences have been a disaster. There are just over 20,000 people living in the county, yet last year, pharmacies there dispensed nearly 617,000 units of oxycodone and another 2.2 million units of hydrocodone. That's about 140 doses of synthetic heroin for every man, woman, and child in the county every year. What would happen to your community if that volume of narcotics suddenly poured in? You wouldn't want to find out. Remarkably, numbers like these have not yet inspired serious action from Washington. Despite nearly a dozen federal agencies that deal with drugs and addiction, almost all policy action is happening at the state level, if it's happening at all. Dr. Andrew Klodny is co-director of opioid policy research at Brandeis University and is the co-founder of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. And he joins us now. Doctor, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And thank you for devoting a week-long series to the opioid addiction epidemic. Well, I don't think the country's ever seen anything like this. And the number of emails we've received in the last 24 hours from middle-class parents whose kids are in jail or have died have really been striking. So what can the federal government do? And the states are working on solutions, but what can... the the federal government, the FDA, do about this? Uh, that's a great uh, question. There is quite a bit the federal government can do. And unfortunately, uh, President Obama really neglected the opioid addiction epidemic until his last year in office when he started to do many of the right things. For example, he sought funding to expand access to addiction treatment. And like you last night, he drew attention to the fact that overprescribing of opioids is fueling the epidemic. One yes. of the things that he failed to do was to see that his agencies were working in a coordinated manner to address the epidemic. So we had the CDC calling for much more cautious prescribing, yet the FDA under President Obama continued to allow opioid makers to promote aggressive prescribing. And I'm concerned that President Trump's pick for FDA commissioner is going to repeat the same terrible performance we saw under President Obama's FDA commissioners. Well, it, that, that would be a disaster if it turned out to be true. Here's a question I've, I've never understood the answer to. So in the United States, if you have a prescription for opioid painkillers, and a lot of people need them <clears throat> for chronic pain post-surgery, but you can pick them up at the local drugstore. That's not true in all countries. In a lot of countries, you have to go to the hospital to pick them up. Would that change make a difference, do you think? You know, I, I think one of the changes we need is much more cautious prescribing. Opioids are essential medicines for end-of-life care, and yes. they also play an important role when used for a couple of days after major surgery or a serious accident. Right. Unfortunately, the bulk of the prescribing in the United States is for common chronic conditions where opioids may not be safe or effective. We have about 12 million Americans on opioids chronically. So many Americans that we're now seeing ads on television for medicines to treat the side effects of being on opioids, like opioid-induced constipation. So what we need is much more cautious prescribing. We want doctors to weigh risks versus benefits better when they prescribe opioids. So really quickly, doctor, that is a change. It wasn't always true in American history that drug companies could advertise directly on television. Do you think that companies that make opioid painkillers, Purdue Pharma, for example, ought to be advertising them directly to patients? Why not to doctors? Well, w with opioids, the problem has been the marketing to physicians. You haven't seen many ads on television for narcotics. I think there's been almost a self-imposed moratorium huh. among narcotics manufacturers. The marketing has been toward physicians. And what caused the epidemic 
that we're dealing with today has been this sharp increase in prescribing, which was the result of a multifaceted campaign underwritten largely by Pertube Pharma, the maker of OxyContin. And that campaign, what it, what it did was it minimized the risks of opioids, like the risk of addiction, and it exaggerated the benefits of using opioids long term. So the medical community began to hear that we had been allowing patients to suffer needlessly because of an right, overblown fear that. of addiction yeah. and that the compassionate way to treat just about any complaint of pain was with an opioid. As we responded to this campaign, as the prescribing went up, it led to a public health catastrophe. I've noticed. It just seems like legal drug dealing to me. Dr. Claudney, thanks a lot for Thank coming you. on tonight.